Mr. Fred. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, let me uh, let me start off by saying uh, thank you to uh, Mr. Hinderleiter and Mr. Gamble for uh, letting me come up here and talk to you guys. I know that there have been some conversations with the local jurisdiction down here, the local uh, municipalities concerning the stormwater program. Uh, what I want to do today is try to address the entire program as it exists in Nevada, if you will, and to a lesser extent, maybe the local, but talk to you from a more of a global picture of what we do here in Nevada. And I'll touch on the uh, local jurisdictions as well. Uh, as a way of background, uh, yeah, I know I, uh, I, I know I've, been, I've been on both sides of the fence. My dad was a general contractor. We had rental units. I know what it means when you uh, when you're done with a job and you've got to clean out your mixer. And what we used to do 30, 40 years ago with the broom and curb and gutter and sweep it down to the next inlet, it's gone. I also know what it means to go to a building apartment. Are we good in the back? Because there's 
a lot of conversation about what's phase two and what's phase one. And, and in, in the context of that conversation, I, I, need to, I need to tell you what's going on here. The original, and I'm not going to read the slides for beta, you guys are, are looking at this yourself, um, were published, you know, in 1990, and there were some amendments made. And in, uh, in uh, I think it's going to be on the next slide, it'll be, in, in 2003, there's what we call the phase two portion of the stormwater rule. That phase two portion of the rule was effective March 10th, 2003. Uh, let me cover, let me come back to that a little later. The other thing you want to understand about Nevada's program is that EPA has the ultimate oversight of the entire program. What Nevada is, is it's called a delegated authority. Each state uh, has an opportunity at some point in time, or has had an opportunity in time, to apply for delegation. And they go through a, uh, a submittal process, they demonstrate authority, they demonstrate a lot of other things to the EPA, there's an attorney general statement, there's a lot of pieces that goes into that. Nevada has been the delegated authority for quite some time. There are still some states that are not delegated, so it depends on which state you're going to go to whether they're delegated authority or not. If they're not the delegated authority, the reference is back to the EPA. In Nevada, it's, it's me. If I'm not doing my job, if my permits don't satisfy the EPA, EPA will tell me. And they can actually challenge my permits. So what I want to tell you today is, while my program may not look like other states, it still meets all the minimum requirements that the EPA requires. And all my requirements are set out in the Federal Register and the Clean Water Act. So what I'm trying to tell you is, if you're coming from another state, you may have a little bit more aggressive program. You may have more of a baseline program. It kind of depends on the state. My message to you is, is that my program complies with the Clean Water Act, which means that I ensure compliance for the municipalities. I ensure compliance for industrial facilities. I ensure compliance for uh, construction, mine sites, individual permits, all of that. That's part of our delegation package. In the, in the stormwater rule under phase one, they did a couple of things. They, they established uh, this idea of industrial activities and they also established uh, requirements for municipalities. And I'm going to use an acronym for the rest of today after I get done with this. The acronym that we're going to use is called the Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System, and that's an MS4. All that means is it's a system that's designed to collect stormwater runoff. If it conveys, collects, and, and manages that system, from stormwater, that's an MS4. So if I use that, I don't want to lose people on an acronym today, so I'm a little bit sensitive to that. I don't know how much background many of you have in here, but if we can get one, think about just your storm drain system, your curb and gutter. If that curb and gutter is connected to a creek, a wash that goes to a water of US, it's NPDES. What does that mean for you? It means that your property can't discharge into the water of US. Where does the water of US start? Essentially, there's some argument about this, the curb. Let's talk a little bit about the second bullet here. Uh, in phase one, they established uh, essentially two different sizes. They established a large and a medium MS4. The large MS4s, we only have three in the state, and we don't have any medium MS4s in the state. The original large MS4s, were two permits. One of them was Clark County. The other one was the Washoe County area. And what happened was, as the program was developed in the 90s, we made multiple per permittees under one permit, especially in Clark County here. In the original Clark County permit, there was the city of Henderson, the city of Las Vegas, the city of North Las Vegas, Clark County, and the regional flood control district, along with NDOT. The reason NDOT was in there is because they have roads that, that, that are within the County boundary. In the north, we had the second major permit, the second major, the large MS4, which was Washoe County. And it was Washoe County, Sparks, Reno, and NDOT again. Those were the only two large MS4s we had in the state. Sometime after that, um, I'm trying to remember what year, uh, I'll tell you that it came after probably around 2003. NDOT decided that it would be better in their best interest to separate themselves from the large MS4s of Washoe and 
Clark and get their own permit. So now that gives us our three large MS-4s. The NDOT permit, which is a statewide permit for all the NDOT roads and highways. And then we have the Clark and, and the uh, Washoe County roads. All MS-4s are not created equal here. And they're not created equal anywhere. There's a distinction between there's, there's conversation, what's an urbanized area, what's an urbanized cluster, there's large versus small, and there's, the key point here is there's regulated and there's unregulated MS-4s. Just because you have a storm drain system in your city, we have several of those that exist in, in a lot of states, uh, doesn't mean that you're a regulated MS-4. I'm going to take an example of the city, uh, Winnemucca here in about uh, Winnemucca is certainly a large city but it is not a regulated MS-4. It is an MS-4, but it's not subject at this time to the stormwater MS-4 requirements. And notice I said to the stormwater MS-4 requirements. I did not say industrial permits. I did not say construction or mining. I said the MS-4. I'll get to that in a little bit. So when we're talking MS-4s, I need to understand in what context we want to talk. Are we north or south? Are they regulated? Are they have a permit with me? From that conversation, it changes changes the answer. Uh, I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong, but I'm telling you that's just the way that it is. That's the way the rule was set up and that's how we manage the system in the valley. Let's talk a little bit about the industrial portion of the program. And I'm going to do this a little bit backwards from what I normally do. I want to talk about industrial because I think that's what you guys are, are focused on right now. You guys, as a group, are focused on industrial activity. So while I may not talk about pressure cleaning today specifically, this message applies to any industrial facility that's regulated. Okay? I can try to get to some of your questions specifically, but once you get what I'm going to tell you from a, from a global and from an industrial point of view, you'll see where we're going. Uh, there are 11 categories of industrial activities. You know, there's five of them by narrative. You can see that. But really what it comes down to is EPA in the rules says, okay, category one is, let me see if I got a slide. <clears throat> category one, if, you're, if your facility has uh, uh, a pretreatment requirement for stormwater, you're, you're going to have to look at this category. And these categories I'm going to show you in a minute. There's another slide that I'm going to show you. They're pretty broad. Category two, generally speaking, it's about... Uh, Businesses that uh, are, it's not light industry, it's, 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 a, it's an industrial type business. Category three is, is mineral mining. And category four is hazardous waste, but landfills, recycling, power plants. We have construction sites, if you'll notice on the list down there, category one. Okay. It's construction. Actually, category three is actually a, a mining permit. But we actually have two different ways we look at that. Is it gravel mining? If it is, it's under our industrial program. If it's precious metals, like gold, as we have here in Nevada, we actually have a separate permit that covers gold, gold mining activities. Okay? Category 11 is light, is light industry. It's not really, uh, kind of, it's not really, I think that your group, if it were defined in the 11 categories, would be under category 2. And I'll show you that in a second. That's the industrial side. And a lot of people know about construction stormwater, and they know maybe you guys know that uh, you might have to have an industrial stormwater permit. That's where it comes from. It comes from this piece right here, right? It's just how we choose to permit it in Nevada may be a little different. It may be called multi-sector general permit. We happen to call it industrial stormwater. I think the EPA's reference is MSGP, which is the multi-sector general permit. In the phase one portion of the program, this is what this is what it looked like. This is all we had. And that existed until I had to issue the first permits to get us into phase two in December of 2002 to be effective March 10th of 2003. And yes, I was a permit writer before I got here. So I was a permit writer of tech services, now I'm back in permits, so they just keep ragging me back in. So March 10th, 2003, what happens? EPA publishes phase two. It does essentially two things. It establishes this idea of small MS4s. And small MS4s really is a difficult thing even today, it's still a discussion that goes on amongst, you know, what's small MS4, who's required to be in the permit. And there's some uh, discussion currently going on about you know, how to interpret the 
build a tent. Essentially what happens is every 10, 10 years everybody knows about the U.S. Census. The Census defines what they call urbanized area. If you are an urbanized area defined by the U.S. Census, you become a small and a small. Right? It doesn't say if you're an urban cluster, it doesn't say if you're a, you know, a concentrated area. You actually have to, you have, to, you have to physically be defined as an urbanized area. That brought in about half a dozen or so facilities. It brought in the Carson City area. It brought in a little piece of Lyon County, Douglas County. It brought in Dallas Air Force Base. It brought in uh, Coyote Springs and Elko. Uh, a little area called Indian Hills, GID. A couple, I can, I can name them all in about California? I couldn't begin to tell you how many there were. I have no idea how you would manage it, a program that large with one single office that we've got. Fortunately for me, uh, it's something we do up in Carson City, we do it well. Uh, let's back up one second. You'll notice the other thing that the Phase 2 did is it didn't... So I told you about the small of its four. Did you see any change on the industrial activities? Nothing. It might have taken away an exemption for oil and gas activity, but I think the court really did that. And the only other thing it did is it reduced construction site requirements down to one acre. And what they call is this area between one and five acres small construction sites, and they also offered states an opportunity to give people a, uh, what they call a uh, erosivity waiver if the project was going to last for short periods of time. If that project goes for more than two months, the chances of them getting a waiver for a small construction site is slim. It's based on a lot of things. It's based on a, a rule called the revised universal loss equation. It deals with, you know, where are you at in the United States, what time of year is it, what's your climate, what's your soil, what's the coefficient of the property that you're on. There's a lot of things that go into calculating the value for that erosivity index, which is what decides whether they get a waiver for a construction site. There's no waiver of that kind for industrial, but there is an exclusion. We'll talk about that a little bit more in depth, a little later. But that's all that the Phase 2 did. Phase 2 in 2003 was set and was done. Now there have been some changes to the local uh, jurisdiction down here, but it's not as a result of the Phase 2 requirements. That's actually a result of an EPA audit in 2005. And the county's requirements to uh, take another look at their program and to uh, get better, to, to gain control of the program, to get more compliance with the permit, and subsequently for Nevada to tighten some of its permits requirements. So when we're talking about what changed in Clark County here, it's really not phase two that made a change, it's, the, it's an EPA audit that made a change. And there's certain things that they're doing currently, there's certain programs they're implementing, certain things that they're looking at, constituents, programs, illicit discharge, that they're doing as they move forward as a result of the audit. So I, I needed to make sure it was clear because I know there was in my, in my prep for the meeting here there was some discussion about well, what changed in phase two. Nothing. The bigger answer is, but there was a change because of an inspection. This is the 2000 map, Clark County. This is the 2000 census. That little red line is what the U.S. Census produced. We just had another census complete. Things change. Things change all over. If you're, if you're, every 2000, every 10 years, when the census updates their map, the county boundary may grow and may contract. In Nevada, we went through tremendous growth in the mid-2000s, all the way to 2006. And like everybody else in the country, you suffer from the uh, economics of the time. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that we're smaller than the original 2000 census. And I don't think we're as big as the 2010 census, but we're somewhere in the middle. But the fact that the U.S. Census has defined this boundary has set the Clark County boundaries. What don't you see in this map? I know if I have a little more to see. You don't see mesquite, mesquite's in Clark County. You don't see some of the outlying areas. If you look at this from a bird's eye view, what you notice is this is the populated area of Clark County. This is the Las Vegas Valley. Just because you're in a particular county doesn't automatically get you in. They look at it as a bird flies and say, what's the grouping? They take their numbers and they determine how to develop this shape. It's my best way to explain it to you. 
Let me say a couple things while I'm doing this. You know, I don't mean to be up there talking this whole time without you guys uh, being able to ask any questions. If I say something that doesn't make sense, I'm not afraid to take the question while we go. You're going to have plenty of time at the end. If I've done my job, there'll be like one question and we're done, but I, I'm not going to count on that. But I want you to know that I'm good if you want to ask questions. If something I said doesn't make sense or you have a, you have a different thought or you want me to expand on something, please let me know. I'll cover it right there. I already talked about this. What's new with the permit? How much? What I, would, what I do want to point out for you is some subtle differences between industrial programs and MS4 programs. Because one of the big misconceptions is, is an MS4 program allows people to discharge. It does not. The MS4 program does not allow in Nevada a program to discharge. The MS4 program is a program that is designed to protect its system, to protect the waters of the U.S. That's what the MPDS program is about is to make sure that we do our job in protecting the waters of the U.S. Okay? There are... In our role, what we do from the state's perspective is I look at both sides of the fence. The county has an obligation to ensure that nobody puts something in a system, has uh, public education requirements for stormwater, it has a number of different things. But it doesn't say they have a right to discharge. It does have a provision in there that says, uh, I think the, the title of it is miscellaneous non-stormwater discharge. And, and the way that it's crafted is uh, the county is allowed to accept these flows without seeing a permit. But it doesn't say that I don't have a requirement for that person to have a permit. I don't know if that's clear enough, but I didn't say they could discharge. I didn't say it gave an industrial facility the right to discharge into their permit, but it says the county can accept these flows essentially without worrying about me penalizing the county. That's a difference, and it's kind of subtle. And I still explain that to local jurisdiction. And I've been doing this for about now 11 years. And it's, 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 a, it's an interesting concept. You know, what do you do about uh, over irrigation of a residential property. If the county accepts that over irrigation because they fertilize it, does that mean they're not compliant? No. That's what that language is meant to address. There's certain things in there. Uh, condensate from from swamp coolers on roofs. The fact that that condensate comes down the building and it's clean, it, it's just condensate coming going to a curb and gutter. If the county accepts it in their system, are they are they violating their, their permit conditions because they allow the condensate to run the curb and gutter? No. That's what that section's intent is, is trying to address. So if an industrial facility wants to know if they need a permit, don't call the county. Call me. Call Mickey. We'll tell you. We'll go back and we'll take a look at your facility. We'll look at this list. It's kind of blurry, sorry. Go over here a little bit. This is what I was telling you earlier about the 11 categories. This is the cheat sheet that we use that the EPA puts out. You can see category one. I don't know how much you can see. You can see there's these little three digit codes here on the left. Those are not SIC codes. Those are, those are facilities that may have a stormwater requirement in pre treatment. We've got to look at those. We've got to determine whether or not a permit's required. Category two over here. Uh, uh, leather processing, primary metal industries, a couple of things, paint and allied products. You'll see some of these are like two different codes. There's a uh, 20, 24, I'm going to put my screen over here. That's just like me, I can't see that. What I want you to understand about that two digit code, let's suppose it's, uh, let's go on, I can read here. This is, uh, looks like uh, uh, primary, uh, uh, like mineral or metal industry. Let's suppose that code was a 30, 30. SIC code. Does everybody know what an SIC code is? An SIC code is a standard industrial classification code. But that code is, there's a code assigned to industrial facilities. It kind of gives regulators an idea of what kind of business they are. Right? If that code, if your code, it's a four-digit code, 
It starts with a 3-0. It doesn't matter what the next two digits are. If your code starts with a 3-0, you're going to be subject to Category 2. If it starts with a 2-0 or 2-4 or whatever in that Category 2 activity, you're going to need to look at this permit and see if you need one. Right? Uh, category 3, second column, that's our mining codes. There's 10. Well, there's actually one. There's uh, 10, 12, 13, and 14. That's where we make a distinction between metals mining and gravel mining. Uh, uh, category uh, 4 is your hazardous waste, your landfills. Category 5 is uh, power or uh, recycling. Uh, 6 is steam electric. Transportation facility, your railroad, your, your passenger transit up at the top. It's, uh, you know, you get your postal service, you get your trucking, and you get your bulk storage. Category 9 is your wastewater treatment plants over 1 MGD, one over 1 million gallons a day treatment. They'll be subject to this. Category 10 is your construction. Category 11 is your light industry. So what we do when you call us is we say, what kind of business are you? We try to work with you if you don't know what your SIC code is. I took a stab at what I, where I thought you might fall, but you guys might have to tell me it's a little different. They, do you fit? If you don't fit, this program doesn't apply to you. I can tell you right now, the highest number I think this goes up to is a digit, 5-0. If it's a 6, it's a 7, an 8, or a 9, I don't think I'm going to find you in this sheet. That tells me only one thing. It tells me that you may not be subject to an industrial stormwater permit in Nevada. It doesn't mean that you might not have to get a different permit from Remember, I do all the permits. This is just one of the programs. One of the things in the program, as the Clean Water Act published it, was this idea of a no exposure exclusion. Let's suppose you are a metal industry. But what if you're in the middle of a warehouse and all your product is inside? All your equipment's inside, there's nothing stored outside, you're completely enclosed. Why do you need a stormwater permit? An, M an MPDS permit is for discharges to waters of the U.S. If you're not discharging to the water of the U.S. because you're inside, there should be some mechanism for that. There is. This is no exposure exclusion. There are 11 questions that you have to answer to satisfy the requirements for this exclusion. We offer it. It doesn't cost a dime. But for industrial facilities, it is an option out there if you're completely contained inside of the building. But it's got to be contained. You can't have a lean-to with, with stormwater uh, uh, storm coming and hitting the side. If you think about it, let's think about why they have the program in the first place. Think about a business in the upper reaches of the Mississippi, and they've got all their, let's take a metals, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's take a company who manufac ma manufactures pipe. Uh, they're going to use uh, pipe threaders, and there's going to be oil on the cuttings of the thread. And they're going to take that pipe, and they're going to store it outside. Now there's going to be rain in that. That rain is going to carry that oil drop down off the property into the river. Now magnify that times all the businesses that are on the Mississippi Reach. Where does it go? Down to the Gulf of Mexico. That's what this program is trying to address. It's trying to address, address the industrial runoff and the contamination that may be occurring to waters across the United States. If you don't have that discharge, this permit's not going to apply to you. That's what I got to try to teach people a lot of times. You know, well, I need this. Said, well, you may not need this if you don't discharge. Your particular industry, by nature, you're outside. You're not going to get the no exposure exclusion. Your power washers. The issue that I see is I covered this. So, what's the code? Seven three. I don't see you falling on the sheet. I don't see you fitting into the regulatory world of the industrial stormwater program the way that we have it defined today. This may not be correct, but it was, I was looking at what it said, building, cleaning, and maintenance services not elsewhere classified as said, essentially. And while it's not listed in the bullet list, I think the narrative description was close for me. You guys might have a better idea. If you guys have another number, we'll just go check it against the sheet and we'll go from there. But I wanted to give you an idea. This list, you can see from the uh, OSHA.gov, OSHA they have a SIC code uh, link on there. You can, you, can, you can go in there, log in there, you can type in a description, you can hunt for it, it'll, it'll return the, the, 
return information. Depending on what you do, you can, you can drill down with the major group, group code of the industrial group. Notice how it went from 73 to 734 to 7349. That's why the first two digits matter. So uh, you can drill down as far as you want. You can do that. There's another code out there, the NAICS. That's sort of a uh, it's a little bit more detailed version of the SIC code. But the way the rule is set up, it says I got to look at the SIC code. All the NAICS does, there's a cross-reference between this number and that one. It's actually a six-digit code, and it actually gets down to a little bit more details, a little bit more better description in terms of codes. Not a big deal, because I don't think that this falls. This, this, because of the 7-3, I think this takes you out of my industrial stormwater program. Don't leave. Let me finish the rest of my talk, and then we cover some more ground. I still want to tell you about the whole program, and then I'm going to tell you how, how you guys are going to fit with the local jurisdiction here, okay? Because that's key for you guys. If you guys want to maintain compliance, what you have to do is plug into local jurisdiction, see what their requirements are, and if you comply with the local guys, the local building counters in your permits that you may have to get from them, you'll be fine. But you won't be worried about me. Because if they're not doing their job to prevent illicit discharge, guess who they get, they get the answer to? They got to answer to me. Because I'm still looking at them. In one way, I look at you to make sure you're not letting anything come off your property. But I'm also looking at them, as in the county, to make sure they're not allowing material to come in their property and damage their system without them doing their job. So that's why I say I look at both sides of the fence. So it's a little bit, you know, you're, you're a little bit intertwined. You may not be here, but you're going to be subject to some local issues. And I'll see if I can cover a little bit of that. I'm not going to speak too much in detail about the Clark County stormwater management plan, because that's not my plan. If I needed to do that, that's a completely different conversation. Because that's, a, well, I'm not going to go there yet. So, from an industrial permit, what we've done is we set up a website. If you need an industrial permit, it's simple. I'll direct you to this website. You pick the program you're interested in, you click the link, it'll take you there. If you go to industrial, see it up there, I hope it's visible. Right? It'll bounce you to this page. On this page, it's going to give you the notice of intent, it's going to give you the fact sheet, it's going to give you the permit, it's going to give you everything. Think about, uh, let me tell you a little bit about permits. There's essentially two different types of permits that we issue. There's individual permits, which is, a, which is like a uh, single source. You're a uh, wastewater facility, you're discharging to the wash, that's an individual permit. What if I have power washers across the valley? And there's a thousand. Do I want to write an individual permit for every power washer out there that takes me six to eight months to create and be subject to public notice on every single one of them? No. So we create this idea, and it's uh, a tool that is allowed for us in the NPDES authority to create this concept of a general permit. General permits can be written for businesses, they can be written for areas, for common, you know, there's a number of things that you can write a general permit for. We wrote one that exists for the state. So what you're essentially doing here is you're saying, hey, can I be covered under that permit? Absolutely. You fill out your basic site information. You fill out who the owner, the operator is, what type of company you are. You're public, you're private. You tell me who the building is going to go to. And you tell me if you need anybody to be carbon copied on your, on your correspondence. Hit submit. Send me that certification with your signature and a $200 filing fee. And the next day, you have permit coverage. That's as hard as it is. I didn't have to go through public notice for every single one. I currently have about 3,000 ID numbers right now for general permit coverage. Because I not only cover this, I cover what we call de minimis discharge permits. We cover pesticides. We cover uh, construction, industrial, mining. We have a set. We have a commercial septic system general permit. We got permit holding tank permits. I've got a lot of general permits out there. I just need to know what you're doing. I can put you in the right direction. I want to get out of your way. I do not want to impact your business. I got to keep you compliant, so I had to find a way to do that. This is it. I can do it in a couple of minutes. Let's talk a little bit about what the permit means. The permit says if you're going to go to a water US, uh, you're required to have it in terms of Clean Water Act. In, in Nevada, we have statute which actually says we have to protect all waters of the state. 
one of those waters of the state is a water of the U.S. This permit only applies to waters of the U.S. as they exist in Nevada. There's some basic, there's some basic information. It's a little different kind of permit. Uh, you, you identify your facility. You document what your site configuration is on there. You, you look at uh, are there any non-stormwater discharges? Are there any, any other industrial? Are there any other discharges that are coming off your, your property? You document it. You, you describe what materials you have stored outside. Your description of pollutants. Right? You talk about are there any past spills on the site. You educate your staff. You give you a site map and you put together a plan that says during this kind of event, here's what I'm going to do to sample if I have a runoff. I'm going to come to something a little later. Talks about uh, pollution prevention, what are your erosion control measures, what are your structural controls. We're going to cover that in a little bit because I know there's some questions about structural controls. This is your employee training. You get inspected. You've got to monitor your site. What are you trying to do? If you've got a fixed based business, you should just try to look at your site and make sure it's clean. If you've got material stored outside that can run off, you have to have a plan that addresses that runoff. Does this permit say? Now let's go. I'm going to go through. I'm going to go through this. Again. Facility information is pretty clear. Facility characteristics. Uh, I mean, the, the idea is pretty straightforward. I mean, I can talk about these in detail if you want me to, but. And, and, and you're going to see, I guess, or you're going to see a lot of these. You can review the information a little later. So I, I don't know that I want to be up here and just read off the screen. I, I don't think that's of interest. But, sir? Curious about one thing. Just <clears throat> in these site plans that you are requiring these people to file, if you will. No. Correction. They don't have to file. Okay. Let me, let me go there for a second. Um, what we say is you've got to turn in your. Uh, your notice of intent, that's your signature saying, I, I want to be covered in the 200 bucks. And part of that signature says, I will have a stormwater plan on site. So you will keep a book on site that is your stormwater management plan, and it will contain all these elements. When uh, Charlie or David, where's David, I saw him, when, when Charlie or David they visit your site, they're going to ask you, can I see your stormwater plan? you sweat, if you will. And that's when they'll look at your site and they'll look at everything else in there, and they'll look at all the records, and they'll do a site tour with you. But, you know, again, I know David, and I, and Charlie's pretty new. He's been with us about a year now, and David's been with us for many years. You know, we're not interested in beating you guys up. You know, we want to come out there and do a site plan. We want to go out and review your whole program and make sure you got compliance and give you constructive advice on how to get even better. If there are issues, we give you an opportunity to correct those issues. If you choose not to comply with that direction, you know, we can go the other route. It's not what we're interested in. I said that earlier. It takes money and effort away from your primary job. What you guys want to do. You want a business, you want to offer a product. Why should I take money out in penalties? It's just going to take away from what you provide. So I'm always after compliance, but I do have the tools to deal with it if uh, I choose not to go the route. I'm not talking about you, but and we have people that do that. They just uh, Nobody's ever happy to see, you know, not, hey, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. I get that. I get that all the time. You know, it seems like uh, uh, it's a joke. It's a, you know, everybody gets it. But if you've ever dealt with our office, that's what we're after. All we got to do is get compliance. We all move on. Everybody goes on about their business. So I got other people I can look at that, that I can deal with. So. I guess the question I was going to get to is that any business has parking. Situation parking lot. Yep. And there's probably more exposure from oil to switching out of these parking spaces than it would be from a tooling company that's cutting the red pipe. Is that part of someone's site plan that they should have the MPs in place for maintaining those areas so that they're not polluting? Yep. It is. Part of the idea is to look at sand and materials if you've got forklifts, if you've got heavy equipment, vehicle storage. You have to look and see if those vehicles are well maintained. If there are uh, staining or there are material coming off the engines, 
uh, you do have to address it in the site. You have to address it in SWIFT. You have to have a plan to deal with it. Uh, think about wrecking yards for a moment. Uh, wrecking yards are, are, are difficult sites to look at, and they're a facility that we have to look at. They have a lot of cars out there, and a lot of these engines have no hoods. When's the last time any of you looked at your engine? Do you think a storm event might carry something off the engine and off the site? A simple BMP for a wrecking yard is to put the hood back on. The engine is no longer exposed. So. What about like a shopping mall or a hospital? So it has 2,000 parking places out there. Well, shopping malls are not going to be a regulated industrial activity by nature. They're not going to. They're. They're. they're a, uh, they are business, but they're not going to fall under the industrial. Uh, if the county uh, says that the runoff from parking lots and shopping malls is uh, substantial, then the county is going to have to address it. The county will have to implement some local requirement to deal with that problem. Same thing with uh, uh, hospitals comes around as a discussion. Hospitals and casinos and you know, these buildings where there's a lot of people housed there comes around a discussion in the early part of the phase two requirements in 2003. The way Nevada looked at it was, you know, all these hospitals and shopping malls and uh, casinos that we have are contained wholly within the MS4. So it's the MS4's responsibility to make sure they manage it. So I did not require permits of the casinos or shopping malls because it's the MS4's responsibility to take a look at that information and decide what they want to do about it. And then I ensure compliance with the county to make sure they're doing their job. Did I get to your question? I want to make sure. What are you looking at? Yeah. Look at the Rio. We're sitting in this building right here. It's a big sign. You know? Try to develop a site map. You know, where does it all drain to? Clark County stormwater system. Do they have an illicit discharge and detection program? Absolutely. What they would look for is there any stormwater discharges? Non stormwater discharges. Are they discharged? They're entering their system. They should be. That's why I don't require casinos to get their own permit. Because the county is ultimately responsible for ensuring that under its permit. All right? Simple little map that we put up is that. It can be as simple. It does not have to be a Google map. You can develop a block that. You know, you look at your flow, your, stuff, your fueling area, your loading, your flow direction, your equipment parking. That's a simple site map. You don't need an engineer to do a, uh, you know, a survey of a property and develop you a, uh, an AutoCAD drawing to get you a site map. We don't have a professional engineer requirement in our permit. We don't have a certified environmental manager certify the information in your stormwater plan. What we do say is it has to represent the site. And, and the items in the permit have to be addressed. And we'll deal with it on the, on the inspection when we visit the site. But what will we do? Well, you need to, you need to account for, uh, let's suppose they got uh, uh, trash bins over here and they didn't account for it, you know, something simple. You know, maybe the trash bins are leaking. Well, let's talk about trash bins for a moment. Trash bins are notorious. They're, you know, 20, 30, 20, 30 yards. You know, maybe they're five yards. They're, there's no top on them, right? Have you ever known a trash bin to be completely sealed on the bottom? Uh, they all leak. People don't think about it. You're throwing a lot of dry goods, dry goods. Like some guy comes in with a paint can. Psh, over the top, it goes to the bottom. you got paint coming out the bottom. Or somebody wants to come in and throw some other uh, bucket that has some, maybe it's a chemical from power washing activity. Oh, I know you guys would never do that. They would throw it in the bin. It's going to hit the bin, it's going to touch everything that's in that trash can, and it's going to come out the bottom. So either you seal the bottom, or you cover the top. You cover the top, you've stopped it from exposure from stormwater. Seal the bottom, you don't have to worry about it. But now you've got a big bathtub, right? Well, simple stuff. I don't set BMP requirements. What I tell you is what I got to have to be met. I said, you've got a discharge. How are you going to address it? 
you may have a different idea than you. They both may be valid. But I don't set the requirements. I can't. If I set the requirement that you've got to use this device and you have a better idea, what have I just done? It doesn't make any sense. We tell you what the requirements are. How do you want to get there? We'll take a look at it and see, hey, that works. We might ask, can we share with other people? You know, Because there's some good ideas out there that we just haven't seen yet. It seems to me that you guys have a good product. You guys are conscientious about what you're doing. You're concerned. And you're trying to do the right thing. That's why we're here today. I'm trying to give you a little bit of insight from the regulatory process and why and where we're at and what we do. And to give you some level of comfort about how you can do your business, stay compliant, and I can stay out of your way. Now, that's stormwater discharges. I talked about this a second ago. You know, there's hydrant flushes, there's overflows, there's natural wells, leaking hoses. I've seen, I'm going to go to construction sites, I've seen painters out there with, with paint equipment, hoses straight across uh, streets and where the connections are, it's just leaking. The same day the EPA showed up to do an inspection. Wow. You know, was that a BMP? Was that hose being maintained properly? That's a non stormwater discharge. That particular company, I won't tell you the name, uh, ended up getting fined by the EPA. I mean, is that simple? If you want, to, if you want, if you want to be fined, let's invite the EPA to about have them do an inspection of your site. Because I guarantee you, on every single site I go to, I can find something wrong. And if I can do it, I know that the feds can do it. I represent EPA. I have a role to fill, but I also have a role to fill with you guys and try to help you achieve compliance, so you don't have to go the route. Uh, not all agencies think the same way, but that's how we do business in Nevada. That's how NDP does business. Is there any discretion when they find something wrong? The EPA, for example. There's they always show up and they see something so minor that it's wrong. Can they use discretion in there or say? There's always discretion. So they can use discretion. Absolutely. So <coughs> Aggressive? Were you, did you clean it up right away on the spot? That plays into any regulator's thought process. Uh, EPA has a reputation of not using a lot of that discretion. It has a reputation for saying it's black or white, and you violate it, here it is. Maybe a pretty minor issue in terms of penalty. Uh, but, you know, regulators have discretion. You know, what am I going to do? I can't stand up here and tell you, you know, you know I've ever been out to a site and I just said, okay, if you do that, I'll just walk, I'll be good. Obviously, we have. We, have. we deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. Depends on the type of violation. Uh, <laughs> I've watched, uh, uh, I've watched uh, uh, a milk company, well, I've watched, here's one, watch the painter, house painter. He paints the house, he comes in, he has a bucket, he's cleaning out his bucket and his brushing his bucket, he's cleaning it all out. Things are cool. They takes a bucket and threw it down the storm bank. I'm done. And that's so egregious I don't have I, I can't I cannot look the other way on an issue like that. You know? Maybe they didn't sweep maybe there's a little bit of dirt on the on the uh, on the sidewalk in the parking lot and they were getting ready to sweep it to the curb. That's not acceptable. But there was no rain event to flush it down the storm drain so they picked it up. Okay, I'm good. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Sure. What if you had a situation where you had a customer that was steam cleaning the trucks and things like that over a storm drain for years? We come in and propose a service where we're going to collect that, recycle it, or deal with it properly. What we might what might we tell that customer about how he can remediate the problem that he's been causing for years? Or what would be your position if you were to come in and see that they corrected it? But there was contamination in that storm in that storm sewer. And this is a small company, can't afford it. I'm going to skirt that for a little bit. And then I'm going to come around to it. Okay. But what I will tell you is you are not allowed to discharge a pollutant from a point source to a lot of US without a permit. That's federal law. Uh, does it happen? I'm sure it does. Uh, 
do we catch people doing that all the time? No. I mean, how would we catch a guy doing that? Um, you're not allowed, you're just not allowed to put anything down a storm drain, a pollute into a storm drain without a permit. If you're pressure washing a truck and it's going right through a storm drain, when I catch it, I'm going to have to deal with it. But I'm not going to deal with it under the storm water program because that pressure washing activity isn't in the storm water program. But I have an obligation in the statute, my own statute, that says nobody's allowed to degrade, to, to degrade waters of the state. And they just did. So I have tools available should I catch somebody doing that. So, do I want to make it a program to go look at all the pressure washers across the Nevada to make sure they're doing it right? You know, you just remember the SIC code list? There are 70,000 businesses in Nevada. Why should I single you out? You saw the list of staff that we have in our office. And you know that nobody likes more taxes, nobody likes more permit fees, so we make the best use of the resources we have. Now, if we catch up, we deal with it. can't look the other way. So, doesn't mean I'm going to go out and make it a mission effort to look for every single list of discharge. It's not possible. Receiving orders. One of the things you're going to be asked for in your uh, SWIP and on the application, what's the receiving order? You know, uh, for, ultimately, for here in, in, uh, in Clark County, receiving water is the Colorado River, which is connected to Lake Mead, which is connected to Las Vegas Wash, the Domingo Wash, which is connected to little drainages and storm drains, which are connected to the curb and gutter. The receiving water is Las Vegas Wash. The receiving water is the first, just look at it in terms of the first major body of water you can identify. That's the receiving water. That's what we're trying to fix. That's what we're trying to make sure it isn't impacted. Our Truckee River up north is pristine. If you think that if there is a, and, and it's, term, it's a terminal river into tribe, in the, in tribe property in the Kirby Lake, if you don't think we're looking at it, you see that if the tribe finds out that there's something going into the Truckee River, well, you know, that's a whole different level of conversation. And i got to fix this. Because the tribe is an independent nation. They have their own uh, program, but they constantly look at the waters around the map. And it doesn't matter whether you're here or if you're in California. Uh, uh, you've got to protect those waters. You've got to protect the waters of the state. You've got to protect the waters of the U.S. That's the job. So when we're talking about receiving waters. That's what I'm talking about. Truckee, Wash, Lake Mead, whatever. Do your best to figure out the storm drains here. Come to the intersection. Here's the storm drain. Just tell me I'm entering the storm drain here. And that ultimately that connects to the wash. Set stuff, you know, your, your site evaluation, what are you looking for? Uh, you look at your site, you look at your area's exposure, inspect your structural controls, what are structural controls? Uh, structural controls may be um, stormwater detention basins on your property. That's a little tricky here in Nevada. There are some areas in Nevada where you don't want to capture that material and force it into the ground because there's groundwater contamination underneath. Because when you start impacting that groundwater contamination underneath, it pushes it towards the water of the US. So I don't want to trade one problem for another. I don't want to trade uh, sediment and a lot of hydraulic head going into a little basin to force perchlorate into Las Vegas wash. You got to kind of depends on where you're at. Do you have any corrective action sites around? Do you have any past contamination activities underneath your site? What is collecting of that water in the stormwater detention basin going to do? What's collecting that water on the site from a pressure washing activity going to do? Generally speaking, it works. But pay attention to your site. Pay attention to where you're at. It doesn't matter whether you're here or whether you're somewhere else in the valley. Pay attention to where you're at. Ask, can we do this? That's a simple question. You get a quick answer. If I don't know, I know a phone number I can call and then I will know. 
In fact, I have a mapping tool which is going to tell me where the vacuum sites are in the state. It's managed by a different bureau, but I have access to the map. Mickey does. So, so Mickey's going to look it up. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you may have grassy swales. You may have areas where you could use that water for irrigation or landscape if it's not going to damage the landscape. Those are EPs, those are structural controls. Right? So. Uh, downstream. To me, uh, this is what I would look for. These things, I tried when we wrote the permit, I tried to make it make sense. I know government guy trying to make sense. It doesn't always. You don't always, uh, we get beat up for, well, at least from the government, you know. I'm coming near the end. Uh, these are some of the questions that I had earlier. So let me see if I can capture them a little bit. The last one's sort of a catch-all because it deals with, this last bullet here deals with questions that are related to the MS-4 down here itself. Uh, what are you pressure washing me? I don't define it. What I tell you is that you must have it. And they must be installed to the maximum extent practical. What does that mean? It means I'm not going to tell you you've got to spend a million dollars to clean up sediment to where a straw bale may work. The local jurisdiction, nor the state, generally speaking, I mean, there's probably exceptions to the rule, is not going to tell you what BMPs you must use or any facility you must use. They're going to take a look at your BMP, and they're going to say, that works, that's okay. Or David might say, you know, I need you to do something a little different. I need you to address this issue. How long do you need to figure that out? And he's going to give you some time frame. And then we're going to follow up and see if he did it. And if that doesn't work, we're going to try it again. We're going to, it's, a, it, it's just, David, is that correct? I mean, yeah. Uh, that's the idea behind BMPs. I don't want to get in the business of telling you exactly. I, I used the gentleman, these two gentlemen here talked about that earlier. I don't want to get in the business about telling you, prescribing what BMPs you have to use. It's not my job. My job is to protect waters of the U.S. through the use of BMPs that are installed properly and used properly. You don't want to use a straw bale for acid, right? It's not designed for it. So if I see you trying to, to run acid through a straw bale or a straw wall, you know, there's, there's probably going to be an issue there. So I, I don't know if I, uh, I hope that, I hope that kind of gives you a little bit of insight for a regulator's point of view. And I don't think you're going to find too much difference whether you're in California, whether you're in Tennessee, whether you're in Texas, you're going to see the same kind of thing. What if I told you to use a BMP and it failed? Who's on the hook? Me. That's why we don't. There's a lot of people out there, there a lot of ideas out there, and some are really good. Yours seems to be working for you. I've seen you do some stuff in Texas. That's great. I have some comments that I'll make later off of, uh, and, and that we might have to address because of what you're going to hear today on, on what you submitted, but it looks, looks pretty good. What training can be provided for pressure washing you're the first. We've done training before. We've done training uh, for construction sites. We've done training for uh, general contractors, home builders. We've done industrial training for anybody who will attend. But we do it at a global uh, sort of approach. A lot of times what we'll do is coordinate our efforts with the county because they have a public education requirement, as I said earlier. Right? That way we can come in as a joint effort provide both perspectives at once. But to pressure washers specifically, this is it. So I tried to tailor a little bit today so I can get to some of your specific questions, but I wanted to give you a bigger, broader approach first, because I think some of these are universal in how I'm answering them. Uh, what types of wash water are allowed in here or grain? Is it a point source that will pollute to a lot of US? My question, it's a three-legged stool. If one of those three-legged stools go away, the permit may not, may not apply to you. Are you going through a BMP? 
Is it being is it installed properly? Is it being used properly? I don't know how to answer that question. I don't have a specific answer for what type of wash water uh, is allowed. What I have to tell you is if you're going to do this, it's got to be done properly. But you're not going to be able to take wash water up and down a storm drain without a permit. It's got to have a permit. The statute says you're not allowed to discharge without a permit. That's the key, sir. Is that a facility permit or can a contractor get a general permit? Contractor can get a general permit or a private facility permit. Like the way you want it. Depends what makes the most sense. Well, if we visit 20 facilities within a week's time, it makes sense to have a general permit? Uh, Every one of them. I different. can't write you a general permit. I can write the industry a general permit so that anybody can apply. If there's enough. Uh, Justification for me to do that? We can talk about how big that universe is. <coughs> no, I got. I can write it. I just have to understand the universe of the, of the project. How many people this is going to be affecting? In what kind of an area? Is it statewide? Is it for Clark County? If uh, if that's where people want to go, I obviously they just need to talk to me. Um, focus on again. Uh, do you really want to be? Regulated in the stormwater program where you may not need a permit. That's the question that people need to think about before they ask it. Because once I give you a permit, you're now subject to all those conditions and penalties if there are any. So, you know. But can you, uh, as far as the site permit, when we do five, ten different sites at night, we're a contractor for that site. Can we get a site permit for, I mean, there's no point in getting a site permit for a property. I don't, I have an issue a contract permit to do multiple sites. Individual permits are per site. site permit, on an individual permit, I not only have to put it in the queue with the other permits that I have, I got to write it, draft it, and I got to go to public notice, and you may be challenged. So for me to do 20 sites is a very effective use of my time. So that's when I would start looking at, is this an industry that we want to write a general permit for, and I can do that. And I would write, for this particular facility, a permit, it would have to be an NPDES permit for the pressure washing industry across, you know, across the valley. But it's not a storm water permit. And you'll have to meet water quality requirements to get it. You'll have to meet the receiving water, you'll have to meet the, you'll have to meet the Las Vegas wash requirements to get it, which means that you may have to treat before you get it. Uh, you're, there's, going to be a, there's going to be an impact to, to your business to do that. So we need to think about that. I'm not saying no. I'm just saying if you ask, that's what that's what you'll be faced with. I don't think an individual permits the way to go. Not for a contract to do 20 sites. I think if you're talking about regulating the power washing industry, we'd have to look at some sort of general permit uh, structure and how that might work. It'd be a general permit, it would be an NPDES general permit. Uh, I might have to uh, write one uh, for a groundwater permit, so there'd be two. You'd have to know, am I going to a surface water in the United States or am I going to a groundwater in Nevada? Because I'm not going to combine the two programs together because they keep EPA separate. They don't have business about my groundwater portion of the program. They have all the rights to the NPDES work, but not my groundwater portion. And you're one industry. Now, do I do that with other industries the same way? I don't know that just going out there and writing permits, well, we'll have to we'll have talk about that. Sir? Cliff, I think what he's asking is what bothers a lot of people is that if you go try to get an NPS permit, a lot of them would just say we're not going to give NPS permits for power washers. And uh, so they try to focus in there, but like he said, 20, some of these guys might do 100 sites a night because they got multiple crews. 
And uh, how's that going to fit into the stormwater pollution prevention it's not, plan? We're not a regulated industrial facility under stormwater program. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Your SIC code is in the 70s. The highest number that I'm aware of is in a 50 range. There's only one of those, I think. Uh, if your SIC code is 71, you don't fall under the industrial you don't fall under the industrial category. <clears throat> so I'd have to write an MPDS permit, a general permit for your specific activity, and. The issue is going to come in to what's the water quality going to look like? What are you going to sample? Are you going to treat to meet the receiving body? What if you did it in trucking? You think you're going to meet the trucking river standards and it's the same as the Las Vegas wash standards or not? Where you discharge matters. Each reach may have a different water quality requirement depending on where you enter the system at. So we can talk about more, we can talk about that more in depth a little later. Absolutely, the precautions you want to take. You know, what do they look like? I don't know. Let's figure out what the discharge is, how much volume we've got, what's in the constituent, what BMP are you looking at? Yeah, there's precautions you want to take. If is this is this caustic material? Is this what is this? You know, uh, what discharge is prohibited? I cannot allow you to degrade water from the state. I cannot allow you to violate a water quality standard for water U.S. What discharge is prohibited? You know, got to go back to the idea is you have to have a permit to discharge. You have to look at the receiving water body. You have to look at what the discharge is, and you have to meet a certain level of water quality before you can do that discharge. That's wide open. There are thousands of chemicals out there. Prohibited? It depends on the receiving water. You cannot degrade waters of the U.S. or state. Does the local jurisdiction or state provide business information about partial washes to certain pollutants or not? No. No. We <coughs> provide information to people we regulate. That's you guys. We try to help you through the system. We try to give you the right information for the right permit. But do we go out and promote businesses or go to a business that you know you need to you need to you need to consider this or that? No. They're not the one discharging. We deal with the people that we would regulate. If you want to promote your businesses, you guys are doing a good job of that. That's, that's not a role that we fill. And I don't think the local jurisdiction does either. Structural controls. Uh, I think... I think I talked about that a little bit. You know, that was the... Uh, you know, take a look at where you're at. Structural controls are good. Generally speaking, you know, not letting them in the curb and gutter can be a real benefit. You can go to a grassy area, you can go to a dirt area, as long as there's uh, no discharge of water in the U.S. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can look at it, but you want to take a look at everything around you, your site conditions, your groundwater conditions, you know, your shallow, your deep, you know. Cliff? Yes, sir? What created that question is uh, discharging power washing wastewater into the uh, stormwater BMPs, you know, like retention ponds, uh, who's, where you have these gravel things. Whose ponds? Who's what? Whose ponds are they? Are they yours or are they the county's? Oh, you mean who has those BMPs? Who owns, who owns the pond? Oh, it goes everywhere from private industry to public streets. No, public street's not yours. Public, public street belongs to the county. Cannot discharge into the county's right away without a BMP. On private land, that BMP could be a lot of different things. It may be a detention basin, maybe a grassy area, maybe a, a drip line across a set of trees. Uh, curb and gutter is not yours. You don't own that property. The property belongs under control of the, of the city or county.
Like a gas station, for example. Uh, well, you're not well, using any kind of gas station for a moment. That's private, right? It's I, private property. I understand it's private. But you're asking me, and I have an obligation to cut waters of the state, right. part of those groundwater. So my, my question would be, how much are we talking about? Is there any chance for degradation of waters of the state? Uh, you would want to think about that as the discharger before you would do that. You know, do we, you know, there, there's a lot of washing that goes along. Building washes, mobile car washes, charitable car washes, church car washes. Uh, it's a difficult issue to answer. Am I looking for all those people? No. At the end of the day, I have to comply with statute. I have to ensure there's no degradation of water in the state. If I've done that, we're fine. Questions a little bit too. I, I can't, I can't really give you the answer you want without knowing more about the discharge, the volume, where it's at, what's going on. You got to look at the site. Okay. Can uh, <coughs> discharge potential addition on five remaining ground rights areas? That's just BMPs. It may be. It's site by site. And one of the things I'm going to, I think I said this at the beginning, but I'm going to have some answers for you guys. You guys may not like them. But these are answers I can defend, and you can tell someone else. You got my card. It's on the desk up here with Mickey if you want to call. But I think with what I'm giving you, you'll have enough. Cleaning activity, waste streams will be discharged in large regular places. Everything that goes into the storm drain gets there now. Can you directly go to a detention basin? That's not your property. <coughs> if you have a BMP installed and it's being used properly for the constituent, yes, it gets there and you're okay. As long as local jurisdiction doesn't put any additional requirements on it. But generally speaking, that's what the stormwater program is about. That's where your carbon gutter leads to. That conveyance system is the curving gun. When does the local jurisdiction become involved? If they identify your facility as causing substantial damage or substantial pollutants entering their systems, they may be involved. Regardless of whether you're in the industrial stormwater permit or not, that's their control. I set the minimum requirements. My program meets the EPA's requirements and is approved by them. It doesn't mean that the county can't be more stringent. It's, it, most, I don't want to say that. In Nevada, that's the way it is. They have the right to protect their system. You can't come and dump what you want in the middle of the street. They have the right to prevent you from doing that. They have ordinances on the books today to prevent you from doing that. You cannot pollute their system that they're maintaining, that they're permitted to maintain under my program of the MS Force. <coughs> so my, my advice to you is when you're dealing with local jurisdiction would be, just talk to them. What do I need to do? You know, am I okay? You're doing the right thing. You have a good product. You have a good uh, method for making sure that you do the right thing by the environment. Talk to them. They don't have issues. You're in good shape. You had a lot of questions about the NPDES permit itself, the MS4 permit. And I grouped them all in this last one here on purpose. You're asking for a question. You're asking questions. Uh, let me rephrase that. There are questions that are written that are not necessarily correct different references to where it was said. I didn't want to get into uh, this one's right, this one's wrong, this one should have been this way, this one should have been that way. 
So what I want, what I would rather do, so that I've, I've done the right thing by, by your group, is you let me come up here and talk to you and try to give you some information. Just to tell you what, the MS4 permit has been around for quite a while. It has a lot of conditions in it. There's a lot of things that the local jurisdiction has to do, has to comply with. They have this illicit discharge. They have to look at, you know, what are the chemicals that are being exposed? Are there substantial uh, issues that they need to be aware of? There may be issues that they're aware of, but trying to determine if they're substantial is another thing. Because they have to be able to defend it. They have to have the documentation, the science behind defending that. But once they define it, and once they say this is a substantial pollutant, they will deal with it. Uh, I understand that they did talk about parking lots. I understand that they do talk about some things that they're working on. It's an iterative process. We write a permit. And the idea is you put these things in place. You write this, what we call a swamp, stormwater management plan for the county. And we they do their workshops. They get their input, input, input from the stakeholders. You guys could be a stakeholder. And you say, we think they should be done this way. And that, and that document gets worked out. And then they implement it. And they go back over time and they look at it and say, was this effective? Did we see a benefit? Did we go over the top? Is this not enough? They adjust. They do it again. That's what that permit's about. They do have an obligation to protect their system. That's where you guys need to think about, okay, you're not maybe not in the industrial side, in my side, but you're probably going to be having to comply with local guys. And there may be more than just City of Las Vegas. There's Clark County. North Las Vegas, Henderson. It may be the health district that you have to comply with. Maybe the health district. Let's talk about big restaurants, for example, and grease traps. The city of Las Vegas, Stormwater Group, is in charge of the grease trap. But the health district may be its restaurant. Can you take that grease trap material and throw it down a storm drain? No. It's got to be disposed of properly. Do I see restaurants out there with a power washer on a mat on, on the sidewalk? You betcha. I drive around and eat just like you guys do. I see it. Does it bug me? Yeah. Do I catch them all? No. I said earlier, there's 70 to 90,000 different businesses in Nevada. It's a big program. We try to achieve compliance the best we can. Uh, some other states are much larger, have many more resources than we do. We try to keep our costs down, we keep our standards set and what we have to, and we keep them reasonable. And we approach this from a compliance aspect. We don't want to go down the enforcement act aspect unless we have to. Let's see. Duration permits. All uh, permits. I think there's a question about duration. They're all five years. I'm not allowed to issue a permit that doesn't exist, but that stays in, in effect in, in perpetuity. Uh, what it says is I write a permit today, and 180 days prior to expiration, they have to have reapplied or uh, to renew their permit. Uh, once they've done it, they've satisfied the reg. Uh, right now, my backlog in individual permits is about eight months. I just lost my two senior permit writers. Uh, uh, once, once we have renewal after fee in, it's administratively continued until it's reissued. So you may see, for example, in the industrial permit, I think Mickey expires in September this year. Yes. Yeah. You may see that she may not get it out by September. That permit is still in effect. So we reissue or terminate it. So they're issued for five because they've got a set of time frame to be definitive. But they could float a little bit further. Right now, we're a little bit back on. Uh, inspections, fees, fees, or reg, inspections. We actually have a requirement. Uh, the MS boards are wondering about our inspections. Uh, we have uh, two different types of uh, rules. One of them is major permittees are inspected annually. MS4s are uh, a little different. They're a major permittee, but they're inspected once every five-year period. There's such a, I mean, it takes us a week, and there's, you know, three or four government agencies we have to tour down here and look at. Uh, industrial facilities, it's much less than that. Uh, data collection, planning, future plans, parking lots, permit requirements. Well, all these things change. Every day. Stakeholder groups get involved. Uh, they come out with better ideas. They drop some ideas. I said this earlier. It's an iterative process. Work with, the, work with stakeholders. Work with your county. Work with your city. Get involved. Express your interests. See how it goes. 
adopt it and preach that. Once it's decided, you've got to get on the bus or be in front of it. So. This is just as a little recap, you know, I have oversight of the whole program. I said that at the beginning. Um, I said this, the, the, the local jurisdiction may be more stringent. They may not be. They may just say, I'm going to do the same thing, I'm going to meet my minimums, and that's it. That's their call. All I have to do is set the minimum level that they have to meet. Not the max, the minimums. Right? I said this just a minute ago. Jurisdictions, there are maybe other jurisdictions in group involved. I've said this already. You know, all of us, all of us, your business, my business, county business, we all have a fixed amount of resources we could use. We make the best use of that to get the biggest impact. Always, you know, how far do you go? You, you don't want to do too much, but you want to do enough to do the job. You want to do enough to do what, you, what is right. That's what we're doing. Uh, you guys are power washing industry. I get it. Uh, if you are an industrial facility regulator on the stormwater program, simple. Here's the permit. I can walk you through anything you want to know on the permit, but you're not. At least from what, I, what I'm seeing. That doesn't mean you have the right to discharge without a permit. But I'll work with you if you need to. A lot of different solutions. You guys have a solution. I know I've seen some of it. It's good. Other people have other solutions. You may not like it. You may not like my answers today. But these are the answers I can give you. Their answers may be good, maybe not as good as yours. But if they're not good enough, I can deal with that. Last thing is, you know, we all try to work through this. We all get better at what we do the longer we do it. It's taken me a long time to get the background that I've got. It takes me about two years to train a permit writer to do what they do. It's tough. Stormwater program, conceptually simple. <coughs> Implementing it can get, can get uh, a little bit complicated. It takes a while to explain it to get to truly understand it. I'm fortunate I've been doing it for a while now, and I still don't get all the pieces of it. You probably don't know if I ever will. I have a pretty good handle on it. Mickey does too. David does too. Charlie does too. If you ever have any questions, you call any one of us. We will get you an answer. That's our commitment to you guys. To anybody in the state. I think that's it for me. This is a little shot of our websites uh, that I showed you earlier. This is the screenshots. There's the Bureau one, the Stormwater. I will tell you something about the Bureau website here shortly. Uh, I showed you some of a slide which shows you our current permitting system. Uh, we're actually deploying a new database, which is going to combine all the general permits into one application. So you log in, you pick your permit type, and you fill it out. You don't have to go, I got to go over here for one. Construct it for another, mining for another, de minimis for another, it'll be one site. We will be deploying a brand new, uh, another brand new database for all the individual side. Permittees will be able to log in online, fill out an app, submit their invoices and fees online. It allows us to create permits dy dynamically. It allows for us to track it in terms of compliance. It allows permittees to submit reports online. Some of those reports will automatically be loaded to EPA. It'll be deployed later this year. We've been working on it for a long time. We're excited. We're uh, doing some data cleanup at the moment. Once that data cleanup's good, we're going to deploy that. So the website that we showed you will change a little bit. I hope it makes sense. I'll take any feedback you got once you see it, if you, if you get involved. Uh, and that's it. I thank you very much for your time. <clears throat> Can I go through some questions now? These are not all mine, but some that I thought you might be able to explain a little bit more. Would you uh, talk a little bit more about unregulated MS4s and how that affects us? Because I wasn't aware of too much about unregulated MS4s, except if you're in a county area that was thinly populated. Most of the systems that have any kind of storm drain in the country have a storm drain system. They have a way to collect storm water through their jurisdiction, anywhere in the United States. Um, 
just because you have a storm drain system doesn't mean that you have a permit requirement. It means that you have a storm drain system. You're an MS4. You have a municipal storm drain system. Whether you're regulated or not comes into whether or not you follow their definition uh, through the Clean Water Act and the U.S. Census data determination. So you'll have to look at what state you're in and see how they handle uh, their MS4 community, whether they say all storm drain systems require a permit or whether like Nevada where it says EPA has said these <coughs> are the regulated MS4s and that's what we permit. That's what we do. And then if a county wants to be regulated, they have that right to come and ask for a permit from me. And we have two of those. Coyote Springs, well actually one of those, Coyote Springs is the only community that's ever come to me and says, I want a permit uh, now. Okay, thank you. Um, the other thing we're interested in is the uh, changing environment from one day to the next as far as the enforcement goes up. And you told me before that there wasn't any really changes in the uh, Clean Water Act. It was due to audits. No, I did not say that. Huh? Well, I did say there was no change in the Clean Water Act. There was a, there was a, I'm sorry, I'm going to let you finish your question. Make sure I got the whole thing. Well, in, in any way, what's driving the, the changes? of uh, uh, increase the BMP enforcement? There's nothing driving these changes. Phase two came and went. I think the original conversation was, if I recall correctly, you were talking about phase two. Yes. Okay. Phase two didn't affect Clark County. That's where I wanted to make a distinction between what happened with phase two and what happened with the audit. Those are two separate events. Phase two affected small construction sites and small MS4s. That's all phase two did. So that's not what's driving anything in Clark County. What, what driving changes in Clark County is a programmatic change because they needed to improve their system, system as a result of an EPA audit in 2005. Now then, was that audit done by your uh, people or was it done by the actual federal EPA coming That was in? done by the EPA and I was there. Was what? That was done by the EPA and I was there. So, I mean, EPA, as I said earlier, has oversight of my program and has oversight of the whole program. They have inspection responsibilities as well, uh, and they have obligations to inspect MS4s. That was, excuse me, our Clark County's uh, uh, time to be audited by the EPA, and it was just as a result of that. It was about a week long, and uh, uh, what followed that inspection was uh, findings and a write-up and negotiation about what they needed to do to get back in compliance. There's your discretion uh, 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 comment. Even in a situation where the county may have had uh, issues during an audit, uh, Nevada was able to negotiate uh, terms with the EPA for the county to come back into compliance without penalties. So, yes, we've got discretion. Doesn't mean they got off the hook. But we had to bring it back into compliance. Part of that compliance effort was for me to update my permit the next time it came due. Okay, when that negotiation is going on, is any of that like open to a public comment period to where contractors can give in input on your negotiations? During the stakeholder meetings or during the permit? Uh, yeah, what, what, what are you negotiating with P, uh, no, that's, EPA? No, that's, 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 that is. Uh, that is a permit issue between the state, EPA, and the permitted facility. And that information then becomes, if there's enforcement, I'm sure there's some sort of public comment period after that. But, okay. Uh, that's, so, that's a, as a matter of fact, doing business. That would be like me having to do, uh, taking a penalty <coughs> action against another vendor and opening a public comment before they've had their right to uh, pitch, to argue their case. That's not, that's not the way we do it. If there's a, if there's a problem with uh, permit inspections, we go through a process that gives, uh, that gives the permittee an opportunity to show cause, uh, what, why he should or shouldn't be subject to the uh, penalty or enforcement action, and there's a whole uh, regulatory process that they get to go through, including uh, their right to go to appeal if they choose to, if they don't agree. But 
no, the public doesn't get to come in and chime in during these kinds of activities at okay. that point. Maybe later, but not at that point. All right. Once you uh, get that uh, close to being accepted, is it ever published any place uh, where once the contractor can look at it on the internet? Once, once we get what? One, one, once you get that permit established with uh, e, uh, EPA, is that uh, open for uh, public uh, viewing? It's open now. It's on the website. Okay. It's issued. It's issued. When we write a permit, we go through a process. We write the permit. It's negotiated with the uh, entity, the permittee. It's sent to EPA for their review and concurrence. Once all that is resolved, it goes to public notice. And the public has an opportunity to comment at that time. And then, uh, depending on how that comes out, there may be appeals or maybe there's other processes involved, but if it's not appealed, it's issued. Uh, in the case of an MS-4, uh, didn't we just go out with the publication of their stormwater management plan? And that is also open to public comment. And that's open for 30 days. The public has a right to comment on that management plan. And then once that process is closed, it's approved. And Move on. How do we know when that 30-day window is open? It's closed. We've already done the approval. Of the I know, but when, when the next one comes up and it's open, what kind of... Uh... What we have on the website is a way for you to be involved in our public notice mailing list. You can go on there, you can click on it. It will then uh, include you on all permits that we issue, and you can look at those at that time. But if you say, I want to be included on public notices, you're going to get them. Don't separate, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch for this one permit and send it to one group. You're going to ask for, I want to be noticed on, on permit issues through our office, and then you'll get an email notice when one comes out and you choose if you want to look at it or not. Excellent. I noticed in your uh, NDSR, Due Development and Significant Redevelopment Plan, was uh, supposed to go into effect in this local area, I think, around November the 1st. And part of that requirement was to look at power washing and develop uh, some guidelines for that. But uh, what I noticed that was different that I normally didn't see was it said that uh, they were supposed to develop an ordinance to uh, move on private property to see what stuff they were doing there. Now, normally, like EPA Region 6 says that uh, unless the water breaks a property line, uh, either air contamination, groundwater contamination, or service water contamination, it doesn't come under the jurisdiction of the EPA. But it looks like that, that could come under, like in this case, it's going to come under the uh, jurisdiction of the local uh, regulatory agencies, or AHJ. Would you make some comments on that, please? No. I can't, I mean, you, you said a lot. What's your question? The uh, question is, uh, can you come on private property and talk about uh, wastewater BMPs that's going on before it breaks the property line? Can I come on private property? Yeah. Not without authorization. From who? The, the owner. I have the right to enter property if there's a permit. Right? But right. If you're a private property owner, I don't have the right to enter your property. Well, what if you see something? I see an illicit discharge, so I sure have the right, but I'm going to be looking at it in terms of statute. I'm not going to be looking at it in terms of uh, anything, but i got to protect waters of the state. If I see an illegal activity going on, what I would simply do is try to contact that owner and see if I can gain access to the property, but I'm not police. I will not go in unless I have approval or an escort. I don't have I don't wear a badge. I don't wear uh, anything like that. I have authority to prevent, uh, in statute, you know, to regulate illicit discharges to prevent that kind of activity. But do I have the right to go onto a private property? No. What I would simply do is try to contact that owner and get to the bottom. Do my research, contact him, see if they would allow me onto the property if we can resolve it that way. Okay. Does the water have to break the property line before? No. No. Statute in Nevada says you're not allowed to discharge pollutant to waters of the state. You're not allowed to, to degrade waters of the state. It makes no distinction about where it's current. The only thing that I don't have authority over is tribal property. So if there, there's a potential for uh, 
breaking the property line or discharging the waters of the state, you got authority that you can go in there. Or, I mean, you might have to bring in the... Uh, I'll have to do my research, contact right. the owner, and resolve it through that avenue. Yeah, because that's kind of been a controversy in the industry late, lately, is whether the water had to break the property line before it become under, before they could, could be a ticket written. Look, if there's an eminent risk to environment or health, I can deal with that. I have authority to call someone and get access to prevent it. But I can't, myself, in our bureau, walk onto private property. Okay. By myself. I mean, I'm going to have to go get uh, uh, someone else to help me gain access. First thing I want to do is contact the owner and gain access that through that avenue. Okay. I don't have the right to just walk off. That's not that's not the state's story. Well, I know, like in the uh, Kansas City area, they have orders where they can just come right on property. I'm not going to talk about Nevada. I'm not going to talk about other states. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll withdraw that question. Uh, as far as I know, and the uh, I'm pretty sure I'm fairly accurate. There's almost no uh, contractors in this Las Vegas Valley that have permits to the MS-4, but they are discharging to these uh, uh, stormwater BMPs on a pretty regular basis. Can uh, Does the city have authority to give them permit to do that without getting a permit from the state to discharge into the MS-4s? Can, can, can they do that under a city authority? The city has the right to permit facilities in their jurisdiction. They do not have the right to be any less stringent than I do, and they do not have the right to tell somebody they don't need to get a permit from Nevada Bureau of Water Pollution Control. Does that make sense? I probably yeah, could right. if I'd hear a little bit they better. But... They can't supersede my authority. Okay. Right? But they they got to either be as stringent as you... They have to be either as stringent as you are or more stringent. On their own. And, they, and additionally, they don't have the right to say, you're not, you don't have to go to the cliff and get a permit. They don't have that right. They don't get to supersede my authority. If I tell somebody they need a permit, the city can't say you can ignore the state. They don't have that authority. Is anybody in the room aware of any contractors getting permits to discharge into the MS-4s? Right, th that was a new one on me, and I'm glad that you brought it up. Uh, that's all the questions that I had. Right. And I'm trying to represent more than just myself when I'm asking sure. these. Sure. Can you uh, supersede the county? If you take one some, you take a stringent rule no. that you know is going to be... Uh, well, you uh, uh, supersede the county? Uh, like they say something that's really not... Right. You know, no one's perfect. They can make a mistake themselves. Can we fall in on this? To supersede their, but they're promoting that to be. No, the county way. says if the county's going to tell somebody, no, I'll see if I can get to. If the county says you need a permit because they're discharging, that's their business. I can't, I can't override that. If the county says, no, you don't need a permit from Cliff. And I'm not going to. I'm not going to require you to get one. They don't have that right. I'll say no. That's not correct. Can't do that. So if I find it, I'm going to go to the third part. If the county is doing something, and I think the information that they have the incorrect information, I will talk to the county and try to resolve it so that that we're on the same page, so they understand what the what the what the other issue is. Maybe, there's, maybe they, they misinterpreted something. So what I'll do is I'll say, well, this is how you interpret it, and then let them decide what they want to do from that. But I, it wouldn't be, uh, I can't tell, you can't do this. You can't say that to them if it meets my requirements, as long as they didn't relax my requirements. But does that, I don't know if I can get that. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Uh, I have another question. Uh, I understand what business orders are, obviously. I also understand what the police department audits are, because I'm a police officer. What is the EPA audit? The EPA has way more at? authority than I do. So, EPA what, so what are they looking at? They, I mean, I know it's probably a little more process here, but when they look at you for an audit, what exactly are they looking for? If they're looking, they're looking at my program? Yeah. 
we have what we, we have what to call a delegation authority, and that authority is, spells out what we will agree to do uh, between the two agencies, how we coordinate our work together, and they look to make sure that we're in compliance with that delegated authority. They make sure that we issue permits for the Clean Water Act. They'll make sure that if we do inspections, we have documentation, if we have penalties that are being done correctly. They look at our program the same as any say accounting person would look at your books. That's what the right. EPA would do with us. Uh, they do have the authority to go to sites. Do they have the site to step up on, on anything? Step Pardon up me? on any kind of process or they want you to do something uh, do something more stringent? Stringent. Like they say, listen, this is what we want. Do they supersede it? Yep. Just like I would account. I see your question, let me get to his a little bit. Um, uh, they, on every permit I write, they have that right to say, I think you need to add this item. I think you need to account for this. And they can choose to say, you will go on the permit. Uh, I've had that experience once, but I chose not to listen. Uh, I only did it once. Uh, they superseded my authority, that language is in the permit. So they have it right. So let me, let me cover this gentleman. He has that a couple of years, is that all right? So. If I'm understanding this correctly, I've been at this since 1990 or before. If you're not discharging to the storm sewer, let's say that I'm a building cleaner and I'm washing the, an office complex with landscaping all the way around it, and there's absolutely no discharge that leaves that building into the storm sewer. Do I need a permit? From me? Right. Not under the stormwater program. Uh, I would probably not. Probably not. That goes on all the time. Their buildings get cleaned all over the state all the time. You don't see uh, permits for that activity from the state. I, don't, I haven't done it today. So. But that type of thing could affect the ground. It could. Yeah, but where's that so I mean, that it could. That so, does, so, does, so does the charity, so does the charitable car wash. So does the church car wash. But they, but they're allowed to do it. They can clean cars at a charity car wash and run down the stone sewer. And that's my rule, my rule is, nobody is allowed to discharge pollutant from a point source in the water of the U.S. But if it never reaches the water of the U.S. through evaporation. That, that's my that's my point right there. If it, if it never reaches the storm sewer, who's like who is it that has to prove that there's a, a negative impact to the environment? A car wash at a, at a church, they get a gallon jug of joy and they mix up a few buckets and they wash a few cars and it goes into a landscape area. None of it ever goes in the storm sewer. Who's going to prove that there's a negative impact? I think ultimately I would have to be the one that would come out to your site to your, your uh, it's going to go into your question. And if it is an impact of groundwater to the state, <coughs> the and then from that point, you would, or, or, or you would have to get a permit. So it would have to be me. I'd have to look at what you're doing, take a look at the activity, and say, this is a discharge from water to the state, and then I would require a permit. And then you have recourse if you don't agree. So me. all groundwater is discharged to the water to the state. Groundwater is just, there's, there's two kinds of water. There's uh, surface waters in the United States, and there's surface water, three kinds. Surface waters in the state, uh, surface waters in the U.S., which may or may not be, uh, 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 all water is surface waters in the state. But not all surface waters in the state are waters in the U.S. You, know, you may have a, 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 a little ephemeral drainage that's not connected to a water in the U.S. They were Lemon Lake in Washoe County. Uh, is a water of the state, it's a surface water, but it's not a water of the U.S. Okay? It's terminal, doesn't go anywhere, doesn't meet the definition. It's got a core reading that says it's not a water of the U.S. So, but it is a surface water of the state. And then there's groundwater. So, there's sort of three little entities there. 
And if groundwater is hydraulically connected to a river, guess what? That's water to us because it's connected. There's a significant nexus. There's a court ruling on it. So well, maybe the term there would be a significant impact in the environment. Significant would be the key. Because if, let's say in this particular situation, 95% of the water that we use to clean this building is gone through evaporation. Probably true. Especially down here in Las Vegas. Yeah, exactly. In the middle of August, that little water hits the sidewalk, it's gone. You know? uh, significant is the key word. Okay. You know? uh, yeah. But that's left for interpretation, too. Pardon me? That's left for interpretation of how significant Sure it is. There's no scale. Sure it is. I would, you have to see me. I would take a look at the volume and the type of chemical or type of discharge you would have, and I would have to make a determination. You're discharging the waters of the state. You're required to get a permit. That you have your right to say, I don't agree, and we work and we work that out. But I'll catch you, <coughs> bring you in, we have a dialogue, we go from there. Sir? That's reasonable, by the way. No, it is. Uh, Cliff, I was curious, we've been talking about the storm drain. What if uh, you know we mediate the water like we're all committed to doing, and we use the sewer system? Does that fall in your jurisdiction, or is that now more of a municipality? And who's regulating that discretion? Me. Okay, so you're you're sewers as well. I guess I am. Uh, however, we haven't talked about that. Say this: that I issue the permit to the wastewater facility, and the wastewater facility has what's called treatment works definition. Treatment works are pipes and conveyances that are connected to the plant. Uh, if you're going to be discharging a sewer and they allow it, we're good. Because he still has to meet his permit requirements at the end of pipe for the discharge. So who's enforcing that? They are, obviously. They are, because it's their system. Enforcing that. And I'm enforcing them. See, I set a permit, set a permit limits for, and I saw your question, Mickey, so I want to okay. come back. No, I, just have to... uh, I set a permit for uh, a wastewater treatment facility that says you have to meet a certain discharge quality to go to the wash, right? They have uh, pre-treatment requirements for certain types of businesses that enter their system, right? Like a five micron. Well, yeah, whatever, whatever they want to do. I mean, I don't, I don't. Pre-treatment is a program that we are not delegated for. We know that we have to have pre-treatment language in our permits, which says that they need to understand all the industrial facilities that are coming into their into their plant so that we can monitor for that if there's any breakthrough of that chemical or constituent at the outfall so that the water of the U.S. at the outfall isn't impacted so that it's so they make compliance with that water body. So if you're discharging into the sewer plant and that goes through treatment and they still meet their permit requirements, fine. But what if you're a, a vendor and one of your chemicals is breaking through the plant and going into the wash? They have a problem because now they're not meeting their permit limits I have to take uh, some sort of uh, action for that issue, and they may take some sort of action because of your activity. So, it's, so that is a local requirement, though. Oh, yeah. It's theirs. They're, they're trying to protect their wastewater plant. They can't have you putting a chemical into their plant, with, with, which affects the uh, biological process. You know, that, that's not good for anybody. So. Can I expound on what you're saying? If they. Uh, uh, if they didn't have a permit for some reason, right? So you're cleaning this facility, and if they, if they are supposed to have a permit to use the sewer, right? I don't know if they're going to make a permit to use the sewer. I mean, the owner of the uh, facility should have a permit for this, right? For you? The wastewater plant will have a permit with me. Right. If that permit happened to be expired or something was wrong, and the contractor wasn't aware of that, can he be held accountable? No. There's a person responsible for maintaining the, the wastewater plants permit is the, is the other entity. Right. If he allowed you to damage his system, he has to deal with it. What I know is the discharge didn't meet water quality requirements, he's going to have to deal with it. Okay. So now, you want us to pull back if you did something uh, outside of what you told him or you could be putting in the system, that's between you and him. But if he allowed you to go in, that's a negotiation between you two. What I'm going to be looking at is a wastewater facility. And did they meet their permit limits? Did they violate anything in the permit that I issued to them? So just to be clear, we should get permission from the facility. Yes. 
written permission that we're going to be discharging into the sewer. Yes. Here's the, you know, the, the product. Or from whoever else, I suppose you want to discharge to the Reno, uh, to the Reno system, to the, to the Reno here. You need to get approval that you can do that. They have the right to tell you no. Yeah, we know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they exercise that right. <laughs> Would you repeat that? Does it make sense to do that? Are you going to be good? I want you to do that. Right. As long as it doesn't affect safety, you know, public health thing, it makes sense to do that, to protect that drop in level. That's what we want you to do. You just got to make sure the city's okay with you doing it. Do you need a permit for me out of the stormwater program? Not the way that I see it. Do you need a discharge permit? Uh, making not stormwater, a discharge permit to do that. Theoretically, yes. You're asking me, that's the answer. Theoretically, yes, but for what reason? Is there no discharge? Because you're discharging to waters of the U.S. Well, we collected this on a concrete pad. You're discharging to waters of the U.S. The PDS, Clean Water Act, says to discharge to waters of the U.S. of a point source of a pollutant. You need a permit. That's a federal issue. I don't have any way to tell you other than if you, if you're asking me, that's the answer. Okay, then I, I need to take one step further. Why is that discharge into the waters of the U.S. when there's no discharge off that property? I didn't say that. There's a discharge off that property. What I'm telling you is there's stormwater discharges that are for very specific universal facilities. Okay? Those are regulated under, under, under the rule. Okay. Now those have to fall under my stormwater general permit requirement. But if we take that out of the picture, I always go back to the MPDS requirements. Discharges of pollutants to waters of the U.S. are not allowed without a permit. You put a BMP in that place, uh, you put a sock on the drop inlet, you still have a pollutant, you still have a point source, and it's still a discharge. It, the, the BMP does not filter all pollutants out of the, of, the, of the discharge. And we're not talking about specifically stormwater. We're talking about it. You're, you're talking about you're talking about wash water from a building. I understand. Yeah. That wash water has certain uh, contaminants in the water. BMPs will minimize some of those constituents, but I, I can tell you that they probably won't get them all. And meeting water quality standards to a lot of U.S. is difficult. So if you want to know. You need a permit for a discharge to a storm drain. The answer is yes. Even if, if, if I didn't do it, the EPA came and saw you without a permit, they could take you on. But he's not discharging to the water. He's going to the uh, storm drain, right? No, 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 no water. You're going to do a BMP? I've completely eliminated any water going into the storm drain. I've used that as a collection vessel. Is it a vessel or is it just a BMP? Is it a vessel so you collect it every day? Yeah, we're a fleet contract completed between truck teams. 
our BMPs up in Iowa is we stop up that storm sewer, completely eliminating water going into it. We extract that water that we're using from the ground, we either reuse it or contain it for proper disposal. Then we clean the pad and we contain it that water. Good. And then That's we pull plug out. I was most of the time I'm thinking I said sock. It tells me that it's a permeable permeable device. If you're collecting it, you're not discharging. Okay. Okay. So you don't need I, I, I went to SOC, I went to uh, filter fabric. So, yeah. or straw bottle or straw bale or some other device that lets some go through. Is it, you know, as, as contract, as small business people, we can't go out and look at 200 different facilities and try to determine. Our best angle here is to just have BMPs process where there's no discharge. I'm with you. Yeah. But then we need coordination of the sewer district to dump this closure. Well, you can take the you can take the material go to the head of the plant if you, if you had to. Some uh, some people, if you look at some of these people, they collect it and they go back and like I'm um, thinking of uh, 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 factor trucks that clean out septic systems. Head end of the plant has a discharge location for people to come in and put liquids. They just want to understand what's the nature of the liquid to allow you to put it there. <coughs> you just talk to the wastewater facility. How do we do this? Right. Or you find some other beneficial use on ground. You're getting tree line, do something like that. You know. And quite frankly, with the surfactants that we use, they're actually good for groundwater. I mean, they actually make the grass greener. They well, take, you know, there's not maybe, really a negative impact out of it. It's the recent yeah. oil and are in there. That may be. But I've got to understand the nature of what's in the discharge to make that determination. Right. Yeah. Mr. Larson, to. Uh, Expand that a little bit. If you got a facility that claims no exposure exemption and you go out and do their trucks and then clean up after yourself when you get finished, does that violate their no exposure exemption or is that within their no exposure exemption as long as you well, clean up the wash what area? I first tell you is if they got a truck on site and there's, and there's leaking of the truck, they're probably not going to get the no exposure in the first place. So you, you have no exposure or you don't. Really, it's meant for the blueprint shop in the middle of the mall. It's meant for a facility that's completely self-contained. You've got trucks, and you've got vehicles, and you're pressure washing. You're better off to take it to a, to a car wash and do it on the site where it's designed for that one. It takes away business from you, I understand. But do it somewhere where there's a collection system. You can build a collection system to collect all that material. Don't let it get out. So. OK, and expand that a little bit as uh, environmental chairman of PWNA. I've been under attack because I've uh, been saying that hot water was an emulsifier and detergents are emulsifiers and be, needed to be treated the same. Or a lot of them in, in the industry uh, think that's an overstep. Uh, what's your opinion as far as hot water versus how, how it needs to be treated? Does it need to be treated like a detergent? Hot, let, me, let me first explain something to you about that and you'll see what's happening. Uh, a discharge of, of a pollutant is anything that chemically, physically, or biologically alters that water quality. You've elevated the temperature, it's a pollutant. That's not an opinion. So if you're discharging elevated temperature into the water of the U.S., you'll have to have a problem. We have that case up in Truckee. There's a system that actually routes part of the Truckee River just a little bit, and it comes right back in the Truckee River because they changed the temperature. It became an NPDES permit requirement. What if the temperature catches up to what the temperature is of the surroundings? You know, it's background. I don't, I don't know how they... I, I'd look and see what the temperature threshold was. I think it's, it just can't be any change in temperature. Can you repeat that again? Is it physically... Pardon me? <clears throat> Sorry, can you repeat what you said as far as anything that chemically, physically... I just think that chemically, that. physically, or biologically. Okay. But if you're playing with hot water at this spot right here, you know, let's say it's 160 degree hot water, and it cools off before it really goes anywhere. But what's the receiving water temperature? It's going to match. So wherever it goes, it has to be... It's going to match. That's the difficulty in temperature. But you still mechanically alter the water, so even if you use cold water... Yep, even if it's colder water. If you run through a, an ice uh, refrigeration unit and it goes in, it's colder. You're going to affect the, uh, the, the temperature as a direct effect on the, uh, uh, either the fish or plant life in the river. So. But you're taking things out of the water system that is different than the groundwater temperature, so it's hard to match it up. Pardon me now? 
the water coming out of the faucets on the building are different than the river temperatures. That's correct. Initially, so it's right. trying to match them up. It's, it's tough to be temperature. Temperature is right. a difficult parameter to meet. Unless you're pumping water out of that river and using it. Even, even pumping the water out of the river and putting it back can change temperature. Basically, cold or hot water. You change the yeah. violation. Would the state of Nevada consider creating a general permit for this audience like you have here that does general power washing from all sorts of industries? Would I consider it, certainly? Yeah. Would, yeah, would you look? You said you had. This is your first one on doing training for this industry. Is there a possibility of getting a general permit that these guys can uh, apply for from the state? I'm not real interested in it. When I tell you I consider it, yeah, I consider it. I think it's a difficult permit. It's a difficult process. And to meet the requirements to go to a water view west and a separate permit to go into groundwater, uh, to be, uh, groundwater is, is easier for me to manage, but the MPDS portion it's difficult. But you know, going site to site is not e economically feasible for most people. The, to uh, apply for a permit for every location they do work. Some of these guys do 200 sites a day. If you're asking me whether you need a permit to discharge to the water of the US, the answer would be yes. So. I don't know, you know, I don't know how else to, I don't know how else to get to your question. I said I would consider it. Uh, I think it would okay. be difficult to get. Uh, you have to filter it down to the water. Uh, I got to go look at the water, but I got to look at MPDS requirements. And how would we do it? You know, the fact that the uh, evaporation is in here, there's so many different factors. Like a lot of guys clean like Starbucks, say the walkway, even only 30 feet long. And that water may never reach any storm drain. The water doesn't go to a storm drain, it's a different issue. Yeah, we're going to talk about they using hot water in order to clean. I get that. Right. Go back to what MPDS says. MPDS is discharged to water in the US. So that's the one for them. If you're discharging to waters in the state, that's another. So we'd have to make a distinction about what is the permit going to be for and where it's going to go and what's going to be in it. And you may have a different set of, uh, you may have different constituents in your process than you do. And do I set, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not a simple process to figure out how to write a general permit for this industry. I'm not telling you that it can't be done. But, uh, we have to take a hard look at it. So basically, the end all is nothing goes in the water. So it just uh, uh, starts. Don't let it get the storm drain. That's your money in the bank. Now, what happens if you dam it up, back it up, evaporation, and sweep up after it evaporates? Because now you're not depositing any, but there might be some residual contaminants that are on the ground and dry up the water. Sounds like a reasonable approach to me. You're dealing with sediments, you're dealing with uh, solids, you sweep it up and carry it away. That's a BMP. Without having physical practice, you're using what you have around you and you're using brooms to sweep it up and carry it away and dispose of it. And then there's no side of the residual problems and once it rains and whatever they If it's determined that the residuals are going to remain there in a place where they could be discharged to storm drain, then yeah, we'd have to deal with that. But what you're telling me is let it evaporate, sweep it up, carry it off, dispose of it. That's the that's that's a good alternative. Acceptable. Sure. For that 30 foot side, I want to start to cover up the drains, let it evaporate, sweep it up. Yep. So I'm uh, stretching. I'm looking at a flight, so you see me looking at my watch. That's all I'm doing. So. Anything else?